Good morning. It is so good to be with you this day. I thank all that are with us on Facebook and YouTube and WPRG. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here and being with me this morning and you that have uh, chosen to be with us, uh, I am so thankful. And I pray God that he will bless me as I go into his word to preach his truth, to teach his truth. Uh, as he says over in the book of John, there's John writing there and the Lord saying, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So we need to know the word. Uh, this world is still uh, permeated with sin, There's sin throughout the world. The devil is still at work. He is deceiving and, and uh, carrying people away in sin. And it is the truth that will make us free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, Jesus said. I want to know the truth, and I want you to know God's truth. And I have no problem with you going to, as a matter of fact, I prefer you go to God's word and verify the things I tell you because uh, I've had people in my own family and people I love uh, tell me things from Scripture that are either not correct or they've improperly uh, stated them and uh, making them say things they don't. So you need to read for yourself, but let me maybe motivate you to, to do that in the words I say. Go to God's word and confirm what I'm telling you, that it is truth, because truth will stand when the world's on fire. And are we going to live a life of truth and live in God's word, or are we going to live a life of sin and be lost? God doesn't want that for you. I don't want that for you. I want you to be saved. And there is salvation in God's word. But there is evil in the world. And there is lying and deception in the world. Make sure that you are following after truth. I want to strive to do that for myself. <clears throat> this morning let's begin by going to God in, in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day you have blessed us to see. We ask your blessings on the day for myself and my family and for the, all those that are with us this morning in whatever manner. We pray, Father, that you would bless them and bless their families. Father, we ask your blessing on this great nation we live in, that we continue to be free and that we could worship as we choose, Father. And we ask your blessing on our young men and women that serve this nation. <clears throat> bless God and protect them, Father, through this day, this night, through their tour and bring them home safe to their families, Father. Father, we ask your healing of the sick. And not only we come to you, Father, asking, but we come to you in praise and thanksgiving for the healing and the blessings that you've granted us. We ask your healing of the sick, Brother Edley Newsom and Brother Mark Sayers and Sister Patty Robinson. And we have many, Father, that are on our sick list, uh, Sister Ann and Brother Tom and their family still need our prayers. There are many, Sister Peggy Johnson. There are many that come to mind that, that need our prayers, Father. Brother Wesley Fleming and his family. Uh, bless all these that are sick. There are many, many on our prayer list, Father. And we lovingly and in, in, uh, in love for them and respect of you come to you, Father, with, with prayers for them. We ask your healing of them, and we thank you for the healing you've given again. Father, uh, bless this congregation at Shelby Valley. Bless us to grow, not only for growth's sake, but for the spreading of the gospel and for the light that we could shine to the world. Let it ever grow brighter, Father, as we live our lives. Father, bless me as I go into your word this day. Bless those that hear it, Father. Bless us to hear and obey, because that's where salvation lies at the end of our obedience. In Jesus' name we pray and praise you, Father, and amen. <sighs> Nothing like prayer, being able to go before God himself, through and by our Savior, Jesus Christ. As the 
Colossian letter says in chapter 6, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So we go to God through and by Jesus Christ, our Savior, and we can do that because we're in Christ. We've been baptized into Christ, and we can do that. And <clears throat> we can go to God. And we worship in the name. That's why we go by the name of the Lord, the Church of Christ, the Body of Christ, the Assembly of Christ, the Called Out of Christ. Uh, that's what the name implies, and that's what it is. The church, as the vision letter says in the end of the first chapter, is his body. So we do that, and we're thankful to God that we can do that, and we want you, if you do not, that you can do that. And I pray that you will hear the sermon today and that you will obey God's word. That's the whole purpose of preaching the gospel is that people will hear and obey. Uh, Jesus himself said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every he, a creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That is over in Luke 16, verses 15 and 16. You can go read that for yourselves, and I prefer that you did. This morning, the title of the sermon is Relations, Relationships. You know, Relationships... A relationship is is how you look at someone or regard them or how you how you behave toward them and how they look at you and behave toward you. So a relationship is is a is a two way street. Uh, it goes both ways. There's two parties involved or multiple parties involved. And so let's look at that. We have many many relationships in our lives. We have the relationship with our parents. We either do or did, and we have relationships with our children, uh, which we love, and we love our parents, with our brothers and sisters in the flesh. We have relationships with friends. Uh, we may visit. We may give gifts at Christmas. We may do several things, but be mindful of them. Pray for them. So we have relationships with our friends and with our neighbors. Uh, we wish well of our neighbors. Uh, with our co-workers, we have some kind of relationship. It may be a good one, it may be a bad one, preferably a good one. We have relationships with our church family, and I can tell you what that relationship should be, love. We are to love our fellow man, and we are certainly to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. So relationships go on and on. There are, there are many, many, many in our lives. But this morning, for a few moments... I want to look at the most important relationship in my life and in your life, and that is our relationship with God. How, does, how do you look at your relationship with God? Do you have a good relationship? How does God look at you in, in the relationship you have with him? So for a few moments this morning, we're going to look at that and, and look at some thoughts. Uh, you know, there are many things in, in the Bible, in Word, in God's word, inspired by God, and these men wrote it down, but God inspired them to write. Whether it was Moses or, or Paul or Peter or James, whoever it might have been, Isaiah or, or Jeremiah, God inspired them to write, and so they wrote. The scriptures tell us in more than one place. But one of the good things that gives you a little idea about what God wants of us and the kind of relationship he would like to have with you and with me is in Micah 6 and 8. I've seen this on plaques and other things, and, and I've read it for myself, of course, from God's words. It's in Micah 6 and 8. It says there, He has showed the old man what is good, and what does the Lord require of you or of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's the kind of relationship he wants with you and with me. You know, in this, there's a, in this one scripture, there's many, many, many uh, good lessons to be learned. You know, you can read a scripture and basically it can have no effect on you, or you can read a scripture and, and try to get meaning and understanding and get what God wants you to get from that, and, and you can gain great depth of understanding. And in this scripture here, there's many, many things we can learn. We can learn how God wants us 
to conduct ourselves. He wants us to do good, and that's what we are to do. Peter says the, uh, that Jesus was our example that we should follow his steps. Well, what does it say that Jesus did? The scriptures tell us that he went about doing good. So if I'm to follow that example and you're to follow that example, what are we to do? We, of course, are to go about doing good. So he has showed the old man what is good. Okay, we know what is good. Uh, Peter says, and I use this quite frequently because it's very important, Second Peter 1 and 3, according to his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You want to know how to live life, how to do good, as he's talking about here in Micah, or we have, we have it in God's word. Those things are given to us. So we can learn what he, how he wants to conduct ourselves, and in this, he gives us good instruction that, that, <clears throat> that, we're to, that we're to do justly, that we're to love mercy, and that we're to walk humbly with him. So he wants us to be one with him. And if we read the other scripture, we know that, that we, we, God wants us to have his spirit, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of God, righteousness, holiness. Peter says, be ye holy as I am holy. So we know God wants us to be a good person. He wants us to go about doing good. He, he wants us to love mercy. Be, be merciful to people. You know, sometimes you're blessed with more than others or you're blessed to be in a better situation than others. Have mercy on them. Have mercy on them. The Bible teaches that. If, uh, if we don't have mercy, we'll be shown no mercy. So we want to be merciful and we want to go about doing good and we want to walk humbly with our God. Uh, we learn a lot, and we ought to learn all of this as well through his word, his inspired word. Uh, and when we talk about relationships, the Bible is rich in, in relationships. We're talking about our relationship with God and God's relationship with us, but the Bible is rich with, with many, many examples of how God had relationships with different men and what those relationships were like. And I thought on many of these, and there are many, many, we could spend several hours talking about that, but, but I will give a brief synopsis of, where, of those. Uh, but one that came to mind, and I don't have my notes, but is the relationship God had with Adam and Eve. He made them pure and perfect. He made man in his image, and he... He wanted them to stay that way. His relationship was damaged because sin came into the world and he uh, cast Adam and Eve out of the garden that he had prepared for them. But you go on, and then there's a relationship I think is a very important relationship is the relationship he had with Enoch. Um, over in Genesis chapter 5, it says there that... Um, down in verse 24 of Genesis 5, it says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, and he was not, for God took him. You know, uh, you, you've got what it says there about Enoch, but then you get over to the Hebrew writer, and the Hebrew writer goes back, and he fills in, God inspires, and gives you a little more information about Enoch and his relationship. In, in Hebrews chapter 11, we refer to a lot of times as the, the chapter on faith because it talks about faithful Abraham and Enoch and all the other, uh, uh, those of faith in God's word, many of them. By faith, verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 11, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death he was taken from this world and did not see death. That he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony. He's telling you about his relationship with God here. He says that he pleased God. That's Hebrews 11.5. So Enoch had a great relationship with God. He was one in spirit with God. He... God, God took him 
and he was very special to God. You don't, I don't read of that, of, of uh, other men being taken like that, one other or two I can think of, but, but Enoch was taken and did not see death. Uh, great relationship with God, would you not say, but what did I just read you from over in Micah 6 and 8? He said, there that walk humbly with your God. Enoch walked humbly with God. He pleased God in his life. And speaking of that, then you go on to uh, the next great example of God's relationship with man, a man with God, was Noah, or the one I had. And in that relationship, it says of Noah over in Genesis 6 and 9, it says there that he was a just man and perfect in his generation, Noah walked with God. Noah, Noah was a, a good man. The world was filled with sin, sin everywhere, and God was going to annihilate sin, and he did. But he saw this one righteous man, Noah, who was righteous before him, and God saved him and his family. You know, he told Noah to build the ark, and some people have figured, I don't know exactly where they get that from, but they figure that it took about 120 years for Noah to build the ark. I do know what the Bible says, that he was 600 years old when he had finished and he entered into the ark. So I know how old he was when that happened. So, and I love what it says there. If you pay attention to the scripture and give it a little thought, it says, God shut him in. He went to the ark. Noah didn't close the door to the ark. God did. He sealed it up. He put him in it. And he, he made it so that he could be saved. And when the water raised upon the earth and it rained and rained and rained, Noah and his family were lifted up and the rest of sinful man died. So Noah had a great relationship with God because he was God-like. He, he lived as God thought he should. He lived righteous. He lived holy as God was holy. So we see a great Example of that relationship. We also have the relationship of Moses. Moses was a special man. He was sent by God to deliver his people from Egypt. Egypt, the people of Israel, <coughs> they came down under Joseph. Joseph brought his family down, and uh, the, the God's children grew in great number. And the Egyptians became afraid of them, began to kill the male children. And uh, God sent a Savior, Moses, to save his people Israel. And Moses came, and he had a great relationship with God. He, he, he spoke with God. He went up on the mountain, and God gave him the commandments, the Ten Commandments, and he brought, he brought them down to man. God talked with Moses as he speak, speaketh with a friend, the Scripture says. Uh, and then, of course, there's the example of Job and the relationship God had with him. God, we go back to relationship. Relationship is how you regarded someone or how you looked at them. And God looked at Job, and you can tell his regard for Job in the scriptures. In Job chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, it says there, To me it is so powerful, and it shines a bright light on the relationship and the regard that God had for Job, his servant. He says there, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, a perfect man and an upright man, and one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Job was a man of faith. We, write, we read of him saying, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Job loved God. He, he was totally trustful of God. And whatever God saw fit in Job's life, Job endured. And God blessed him beyond measure when, when he came through the trials that Satan was allowed to put upon him. And, and Job withstood those. And God loved him for that. 
God knew his servant Job. Satan didn't. So <clears throat> he knows you and he knows me. What does he know about us? We'll talk about that more in a moment. But <clears throat> then there's Abraham. Abraham, a man of faith, uh, whatever God asked Abraham to, to do, he did. Whatever, wherever he asked him to go, he went. Uh, it starts out telling him, Abraham, to take up his goods and, and go into a land that he didn't, didn't know, and he did. He asked him to take his son up on the mountain and, and offer him as a sacrifice, and Abraham was ready to do that had drawn back the knife to take his son's life. And the angel stayed his hand, and he did not take his son's life. And, and God provided a sacrifice. God provided a sacrifice for you and for me. And that was his son, Jesus, on the cross of Calvary. We needed salvation, and God sent it to us. We needed saving from sin, and God sent us his son. So I like this writing about Abraham. Abraham had been because, promised because of his faithfulness that through his seed or through his generations, children and so on down the line, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That what, that's God's word. God's promised him, gave him strength on the mountain when he was about to take his son's life. If you come over in the Hebrew letter and read more about Abraham in that same chapter 11, You'll find out that Abraham knew that if he took his son's life, how's he going to keep my promise that, that he's going to bless all nations through my child? He's going to keep it. If I take his life, he'll raise him up. Abraham had strong faith in God. And as the Hebrew writer also says, without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Abraham diligently sought and served the Lord. And God blessed him. God blessed him. I am a child of God through the seed of Abraham. Jesus Christ came down through the seed of Abraham. And it is through that seed that we can make our way back to heaven through Jesus Christ. So, Abraham was a strong, he was called a friend of God because he was so faithful and he had such strong belief in God. Then there was David. David was a man after God's own heart. And if you, you know the 23rd Psalms, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You can, you can see the relationship David had with God. He had total faith in God. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they do comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David had a great relationship with God, and God had a a great relationship with his servant David. He blessed him. He blessed him. How about my relationship and your relationship with God? I can tell you, he is your God, and besides him, there is none else. The 100 Psalms, verse 3, three says, Know ye not the Lord, that he is God? It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastor. Do you know your relationship with God? You are a man. You're part of his creation. I'm a man. I'm part of his creation. I'm not the creator of, the, of existence. God is. He made me. He made you. We were created as Isaiah rats for his glory. Are you a glory to God? Is that your relationship with God? I hope it is. I hope it is mine. And I strive toward that. You know, you know, hearing the gospel and obeying the gospel 
is, is why I preach, so that people will. But once they've obeyed the gospel and they develop this relationship, become a child, a uh, son or daughter of God Almighty, then the battle against evil in the world truly begins because Satan is after you. He is that roaring lion trying to devour you and take you back out into the world. And it is our, it is our responsibility and part of our relationship with God is that we continue to grow in his word because as we grow in the word, we grow closer to him. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you, James writes. Are you trying to grow closer to God? Because God is capable of all blessings. I have not seen or ear heard the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Do you have a loving relationship with God? The knowledge and what will bring love in your life and to you for God is in the word. It's in the word. And the more we read, the more we grow. That's what Peter ends his writings with. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The unmerited love that God and Christ had for you and for me. We didn't deserve it, but God loved us. Love overcomes the things, the undeserving. It overcomes the fact that I was undeserving. God loved me and he granted me salvation and he'll grant you salvation through his word. But it is my responsibility to continue to grow and to try to go closer to God and walk with him, be in step with him, be righteous and holy as he is holy, as I quoted you there a few most moments ago. He is our creator, and his love, his behavior for us has been nothing but love. While we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us, Paul wrote to the Romans and Romans 5 and 8. God's thoughts toward you and toward me and how he looks on us is he loves us. He doesn't want us to live in sin. He doesn't want us to be lost. His will, as Peter writes, is that none should perish. As, as 2 Peter 3 and 9 says, the Lord is not slack, counting his slackness, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. God wants to have a good relationship with you, but you must, you must forsake sin and come and live in a righteous manner. He doesn't want us to be lost. And, you know, Paul also writes in the Roman letter, of course, he tells us in, in Romans 3 and 23 and Romans 5 and 12 that all have sinned, so all of mankind sins, but God's willing to forgive them. And that's why I quoted you there from Romans 5 and 8. He, com he commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But also in James 4 and 4, he says this, Know ye not that the friendship to the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. We cannot stay in sin. We can we can profess to be God's friend, but if we're living in sin, we're, we are not. We're enemies with God. And don't be blinded in your relationship with God. If you've not been baptized for remission of your sin, you're still in sin. Is what the scripture says. That's what Peter told them on the day of Pentecost, is repent and be baptized. Change, come out of sin, be baptized for remission of those sins to get rid of them, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost which is God's spirit, which is God's righteousness, which is his holiness, because you are then pure, and you become a son or daughter of God Almighty. And we know that, that sin separates us. We know that from the word. We know that from Isaiah's writings, that sin separates us from God. Paul writes to the Romans about how to live, especially Christians, but it says there in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Give good, he gives us good instructions on how to have a relationship, the right relationship with God. <clears throat> I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, except the one to God, which is your reasonable servant. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, and be that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God's will is that you not be lost. 
He sent the gospel message through men like myself and through his son that you could be saved, through men like Peter and Paul that preached the gospel. God loves you. He sent his son. We can be forgiven of those, son, of those sins if we hear his word and believe it. If we repent, change, we can't continue to sin and know that we're in sin and we've got to come out and that we confess Jesus as the Christ and that we're buried with Jesus in baptism for the remission of those sins and we rise to walk in a new life. I want that for you. God wants that for you. Will you come? Will you come this morning? If you're not uh, close, go to a church of Christ near you and they'll assist you in being baptized into Christ. If you're here, you come and we will assist you. We love you. God loves you. May you have a wonderful day and a wonderful life and may heaven be your home. But that is left up to you. May God bless you to make heaven your home by your obedience.